Our journey begins in Shiraz, gateway to the ruins of Persepolis and Pasargadi. We then travel north to the desert city of Yazd, where we spend two nights. Next stop is Isfahan, famous for its opulent palaces and covered bridges. After three nights here, we drive to the capital Tehran, stopping en route at Kashan. We then fly north to Tabriz, gateway to the southern Caucasus. Shiraz is known as the city of poets and literature, and amongst the locals is the city of gardens, due to its abundance of trees and lush green spaces. Among these is the beautiful Aram Gardens, a haven of tranquility amid the bustling city outside its walls. This is one of the most famous and beautiful Persian gardens, and is a popular spot for locals and tourists alike to enjoy the avenues of towering cypress trees and colourful flower beds. At one end of the gardens lies a beautiful three-storey pavilion with a reflective pool at its base. The colourful upper façade includes tiles inscribed with poems from the famed Persian poet Hafez. Close to Iram Gardens is Nazir Olmok Mosque, otherwise known as the Pink Mosque. The exterior of the Winter Prayer Room features arabesque arches with wood panelled windows, which adds a colourful beauty to the interior as the light shines through the stained glass and onto the Persian rugs that adorn the floor. Shiraz has a vibrant culture of art and craftsmanship, and this is very much an evidence in the ornate and intricate pink tiles that give the mosque its name. Vakil Bazaar is the bustling hub of Shiraz, and perhaps one of the most vibrant in Iran. It's a labyrinth of lanes and alleyways that sell goods in every colour of the rainbow. This is a trade hub for merchants selling all manner of goods, and it is where the locals come to shop and meet friends. The halls are filled with the smell of spices and Persian sweets, which linger throughout the bazaar, making for an amazing sensory experience. About 60 kilometres north of Shiraz lie the ruins of the once great city of Persepolis, the former capital of the Archimedes Empire. Construction of the city began around 518 BC by Darius the Great and was continued over many years by his descendants. The main purpose of the complex was as a spring and summer royal residence and ceremonial centre where dignitaries came to bring gifts and pay respects to the king. Around the complex there are many bas-reliefs depicting these scenes. Today, Persepolis is a mere shadow of its former self. The grand staircases and remaining colonnades of Takara Palace are among the most intact parts. Nonetheless, this is perhaps the most important historic site in Iran, and walking amongst these ancient ruins offers a surreal glimpse into a rich and glittering past. Just a stone's throw from Persepolis lies the imposing site of Naqsh-e-Rostam, where Darius the Great and his successors had their monumental tombs carved into the cliff. The dramatic facade of each tomb is constructed like a cross with an entrance leading into the tomb chamber cut deep into the rock. Beneath the tombs and in the adjacent rock face are carvings commemorating various battles. It's hard to grasp that these well-preserved reliefs were carved by artisans more than two and a half thousand years ago. The next day we drive north to the desert city of Yazd, the roads are good, and our friendly driver is highly experienced. Yazd has resisted modern urbanization and maintained its traditional structure. It is the driest major city in Iran, with an average annual rainfall of only 60 millimeters. For this reason, most houses are built of mud bricks and have domed roofs, which serves as insulation, preventing heat from passing through. 
The city skyline is dotted with wind catchers, known as bad gears. These structures also assist with cooling by funneling the breeze into the dwellings below. On the outskirts of Yazd is one of the most notable reminders of the early Persian religion of Zoroastrianism, the Towers of Silence. These were used as open burial pits. The deceased were placed inside the high circular walls of the tower and left to be decomposed by birds of prey and the elements. This form of burial was still common until the 1970s. The Zoroastrian fire temple within the city is another significant site, which contains a flame that has been burning continuously since 470 AD. The flame has moved throughout the centuries to various different locations and has been in its present fire temple in Yazd since 1934. Leaving Yazd, we continue our journey north to the historic city of Isfahan. On the way, we stop to stretch our legs and take a closer look at the ingenious irrigation system known as a Karnat, which provides precious water to the dry desert regions via an underground tunnel system. The water is carried from the mountains in the north through these channels using only gravitational force. And we get a friendly acknowledgement from some passing truck drivers. Arriving into Isfahan, we head to our home for the next three nights, the historic Abassi Hotel. The Abassi is said to be one of the most beautiful hotels in the world. Built 400 years ago as a caravanserai, this historic building is set around a huge quadrangle of beautiful gardens and fountains, and it's located very close to Imam Square, which is the beating heart of the city. And it is at Imam Square that we begin our exploration of Isfahan the next day. Covering an area of almost 90,000 square metres, it is a hub for local people to congregate, have picnics and maybe take a horse and cart ride. At the southern end is the Imam Mosque, which is regarded as one of the masterpieces of Persian architecture. At the eastern side is the Sheikh Lot Fola Mosque, which is noted for its intricate tile work. And on the western side is the beautiful Ali Kapu Palace. Among Isfahan's claims to fame are the covered bridges that span the Zayende River. Perhaps the finest of these is the Hachu Bridge, which was built around 1650. Its ornate stone arches and the beautiful tiled pavilion at its centre serve as meeting places for local people to socialise and engage in their most popular of Iranian pastimes, picnicking. In the centre of Isfahan lies the historic Chahil Satoun Palace, built during the time of Shah Abbas II in the mid-17th century. It is situated in the centre of beautiful lush gardens, which flourished due to the Karnat irrigation system. The front porch of the palace has 20 columns that reflect in the pool in front, giving it the informal name, 40 Column Palace. But it is the interior of the main hall that truly dazzles. The ceiling of this large room is perhaps the best example of its kind in Iran, with detailed patterns in blue, green and gold. The walls are decorated with intricate murals and frescoes, depicting life when this place was used to entertain visiting dignitaries. The next day, we leave Iran's crown jewel behind and take to the road again, 
bound for the capital Tehran, 420 kilometers to the north. The contrast is stark as we enter the huge modern city that is home to 14 million people, nearly 20% of the entire population of the country. There is little of the splendor of ancient Persia to be seen here, but one such gem lies in the heart of the historic core of the city, Golestan Palace. The palace complex is one of the oldest sites in Tehran. Formerly used as a royal residence, the palace today is a fascinating museum, noted for its colorful and detailed tile work. This spectacular terrace, known as the Marble Throne Veranda, was built in 1806 and is a masterpiece of marble carvings, tile work and mirrors. The throne embodies the finest of Iranian architecture and is made of 65 pieces of yellow marble from Yazd province. After two nights in Tehran, we head to the airport for our flight north to Tabriz, our final destination in Iran. We arrive into Tabriz in the afternoon and transfer to our hotel, where we later enjoy dinner in the revolving rooftop restaurant. Just an hour's drive from Tabriz lies the troglodyte village of Kandavan. This is one of only a few inhabited rock villages in the world, and visiting here is like stepping back in time. The strange shapes of cones and beehives were caused by volcanic eruptions thousands of years ago, and centuries of weathering and erosion created natural caves. Kandavan is still home to around 600 people and offers a truly authentic experience of life in a cave village. And so on to the next phase of our journey as we say goodbye to ancient Persia and head to the border and the gateway to the Southern Caucasus. We arrive at the town of Megri on the Armenian side and drive to Goris for one night. Next stop is the capital Yerevan, where we spend three nights before driving to Dilijan in the very north of the country. After two nights here, we cross the border into Georgia and its capital, Tbilisi, where we spend four nights. We visit the historic town of Gori, then head to the Karketi wine growing region. Finally, we cross into Azerbaijan for a one night stop at Sheki, then on to the capital, Baku, before flying home. Across the border in Armenia, the landscape is lush and green. After an overnight stop in Goris, we continue on to Yerevan. En route, we stop at the amazing 9th century Tatiev Monastery, perched on the edge of a deep gorge of the Voratin River. It is one of the most significant monuments in Armenia. For centuries, the monastery was home to important monks, philosophers, musicians and painters. No less spectacular than the monastery is the journey on the so-called Wings of Tatiev, which is the longest aerial tramway in the world with only one continuous suspension rope. The view is spectacular as we leave the monastery behind and glide over two mountain peaks and the Voratin Gorge during our scenic 12-minute ride. We continue our journey through the hills and canyons as we head north to the Armenian capital, where we spend three nights. Yerevan is a city of museums, art galleries and stately Soviet-era buildings sitting in the shadow of Mount Ararat. An important site in the city is the Memorial Complex, 
which is dedicated to the 1.5 million Armenians who perished in the genocide of 1915. At the centre of the monument, there is the memorial sanctuary with an eternal flame surrounded by 12 tall basalt slabs. The arrow-shaped granite column represents the spiritual rebirth of the Armenian people. About 35 kilometres from Yerevan is one of the most important and outstanding sites in all of Armenia, Geghart Monastery. The monastery was originally founded by St. Gregory the Illuminator, who brought Christianity to Armenia in 301 AD. At that time, the monastery was just a small cave chapel. And the acoustics inside are extraordinary, as we soon discover. On our way back to Yerevan, we stop for an alfresco lunch in the orchard of a local family. Our guide explains about the traditional Armenian wind instrument, the duduk, and as we enjoy the delicious food, local musicians demonstrate its unique sound. final night in Yerevan, we take a stroll to a nearby neighbourhood, where we enjoy an evening of good food, fun, laughter and music at the home of another local family. The next day we say goodbye to Yerevan and head to the north of the country and the beautiful town of Dilijan. We arrive at our hotel which overlooks a valley in Dilijan National Park. It is a beautiful location and the hotel oozes rustic charm. We venture into the beautiful, tranquil forest that boasts 900 species of plants and 150 species of birds. It has been said that if there were forests, mountains and mineral springs in paradise, then it would look like Dilijan. On our return to the old town, the local school children put on a display of traditional dance for our group. And so to the next phase of our journey, as we drive through the lush countryside and onto the Georgian capital of Tbilisi. Our home for the next four nights is the Marriott Hotel, which is centrally located for everything that this exciting capital has to offer. Tbilisi is without doubt one of the most exciting and perhaps underrated cities in Europe. 
Situated on both banks of the Mitgavari River and surrounded on three sides by mountains, it has a population of around one and a half million people. It is both a vibrant and cosmopolitan metropolis and a collection of quaint and charming neighbourhoods. The delightful old town is a labyrinth of winding streets and twisting alleys, with charming buildings adorned with picturesque balconies. Overlooking it all stands the statue of Mother Georgia, the sword representing protection and the cup in her hand representing the centuries-old tradition of Georgian winemaking. Tbilisi's architecture is an eclectic mix of ancient structures, Soviet-era buildings and eye-catching contemporary glass and steel structures. Among these are the eye-catching Peace Bridge and the new theatre known as the Pipes. After our exploration of Tbilisi, we enjoy a change of pace as we set out for the lush and picturesque wine-growing region of Karketi. Our home for the next two nights is at Lake Lapota, and this is our base to discover the history and cultural significance of Georgia's long tradition of wine-growing. Our lovely chalet-style accommodation sits at the edge of the lake, with views across the water from our balconies. Georgia is generally considered to be the birthplace of wine, and its history can be traced back over 8,000 years. Through the centuries, Georgians have made wine by putting the grapes in large earthenware vessels, known as quaveries, which are then buried in the cellar floor. This method is still used in Georgian wine production today, alongside more modern methods for Georgia's large and expanding export market. Georgians are famed for their hospitality, and the supra, an extravagant meal with many courses, is often depicted in artworks. This tradition is a backbone of Georgian social culture, and to attend a supra is a privilege and an extraordinary experience. We arrive at the home of our hosts to the smell of freshly baked bread and enter the hall with its heavily laden table. The supra is directed by a toastmaster who makes a number of toasts throughout the feast and invites us to make toasts in return. And as we slowly work through the delicious courses of local dishes, we are entertained with some traditional dance. More toasts follow, and more courses. And then a display of traditional song from the Toastmaster and his friends. So, with the sound of Georgian music still ringing in our ears, we head to our final destination, Azerbaijan. After a one-night stop at Sheki, we continue on to the capital, Baku. Located on the western side of the Caspian Sea, Baku is a bewildering mix of architectural styles. 
In fact, it contains one of the world's most prolific collections of modern architecture. The most famous of which are three modern towers, shaped like flames, that dominate the skyline. Inspired by Azerbaijan's nickname, the Land of Fires, the flame towers sit side by side with the old city, which dates back to the 6th century. Our two nights stay in this exciting city, which still flies beneath the tourist radar, is a fitting end to our memorable adventure to ancient Persia and the Southern Caucasus.